Cek cek cek. Cek cek dari Cek, cek. Halo, halo, cek, 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 cek. Halo. Tes, tes. Tes, tes. Makarin tes. Halo. 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 Yes. Dengar. Dengar. Halo. Halo. Bisa dengar. Jelas. Bagus. Eksplosi. Yes. Wah. Daftar betul. Pakai jas ya. Saya. Sudah lama. Kali sekali sekali. Soalnya. Chair. Chair. Chairman harus. Chairman <laughs> harus. Pakai jas. Enggak. Soalnya ada kan keluar nih banyak yang dia dari luar juga. Iki. Iya yeah, iya yeah, iya yeah. no 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 point made. ini kita sebagai ini apa di lapangan kita pakai ini aja dasi dah. Iya yeah, iya. Yeah. Who's Mas Zuki apa kabar? Baik baik ini siapa ini dari KBRI so Oslo. Oh iya. Hey 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 mau Gimana ki? Apa apa? Ah ah. Aduh. Coba zoom, ah, baru jelas, baru jelas. Waduh, background, background-nya background Solo juga itu. <laughs> Oslo dekat dengan Solo. Okay. Oslo dekat Solo. Tinggal di ini ya, anagram itu. Iya. Ini KBRI Bangkok. Mau kapan... Selamat siang Pak Masuki. Selamat siang. Dengan Diki Komar, Pak Masuki apa kabar? Oh baik baik, Asmansi apa kabar? <laughs> baik baik baik. Pak Makari, Pak Dubas. Apa kabar Pak Thomas? Baik baik Bapak, baik senang bisa melihat melalui virtual. Iya. <laughs> kali kali harus begini nih, kalau enggak nggak bisa lihat lihatan nih. <laughs> Ibu-ibu sekalian. Ya. Oh.
to all esteemed participants with a record of 463 participants who come from different walks of life, such as from the Legislative Assembly, political parties, think tanks, academicians, foreign representatives in Indonesia, Indonesian representatives abroad, NGOs, students, and many more for being able to join us here today in this virtual gathering of a webinar titled The Myanmar Crisis, Regional and International Solution. As you may have heard or seen on international news on the development of the Myanmar crisis that has consumed many lives, reaching a death toll of over 320 people and thousands injured, in addition to the forced closure of tens of thousands of businesses and shops or stores since the military coup on February 1st of this year. It is with this disturbed facts and feelings that President Jokowi, Joko Widodo called on an informal ASEAN summit to find a solution to the Myanmar crisis. For your information, that Indonesia is now, or maybe the most trusted ASEAN members that could have talks with Myanmar and Indonesia's foreign minister is instrumental in this effort. However, it is very unfortunate that Her Excellency Indonesian Foreign Minister, Mrs. Retno Marsudi, could not make to this esteemed gathering due to an urgent matter that, should, that she should attend to. Nevertheless, with us here today, we have four distinguished speakers in our panel, and they are His Excellency, Lieutenant General Retired Agus Vijoyo, the Governor of Lemhanas, or the National Resilience Institute of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Mr. Siddhartho Suryo Diporo, Director General for ASEAN Cooperation, His Excellency Mr. Marzuki Darusman, former Attorney General of the Republic of Indonesia, and also former Chair on United Nations International Independence Tech Finding Mission on Myanmar. And lastly, Dr. Philip Fermonte, Executive Director of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Now let me give you a rundown of our program today. First, we will have a welcoming remark by Mr. S.D. Darmudo. Chairman of the Jababeka Group. And second, we will have an opening remarks by His Excellency <laughs> Professor Dr. Makarim Wibisono, Chairman of the Governing Board of the Indonesian <laughs> Council on World Affairs. Third, is the Minister's keynote address delivered by His Excellency Mr. Siddhartho Suryodipuro on her behalf. Fourth, Presentation of the four speakers, followed by Q&A and moderated by Mr. Denis Suryo, who is also co-chair of the executive board of the Indonesian Council on World Affairs. Lastly, we have the closing remarks by His Excellency Mr. Ibrahim Yusuf, the vice chairman of the governing board of the Indonesian Council on World Affairs. Before we start with the program, I would like to especially thank the support of our sponsors, the Jabba Beka Group as our main sponsor with its special support of technical team and technical matters, as well as providing the venue from Nara Batavia, where we broadcast this event live through President TV. And also we have supporting sponsors, Ernst Young and FPCI, the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, that are instrumental in the success of the webinar. And again, thank you to the sponsors. Now, the welcoming remarks of Jababeka Group Chairman, Mr. Darmono. The screen is yours. Thank you. 
Her Excellency Mrs. Retno Marsudi, Minister of, of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, at this occasion represented by His Excellency Siddhartha R. Suryo Dipuro, Director General for Asian Cooperation, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. His Excellency Professor Dr. Makarim Bibisono, Chairman of the Governing Board of the Indonesian Council on World Affairs and former permanent representative of Indonesia to the United Nations. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me on behalf of Jababeka Group to welcome you at the President Lounge of Manara Batavia and at the same time to express my highest appreciation for your participation at this webinar. The topic of our webinar this afternoon is Myanmar Crisis, Regional and International Solution, whereby we will hear from the distinguished speakers on the variety of perspectives about the implication of the military coup in Myanmar and the response of neighboring countries. The convening of this webinar is opportune and timely as President Jokowi has made the call for an emergency summit of Asian leaders to find a solution to the Myanmar crisis. What is happening in Myanmar can no longer be considered the domestic affairs of Myanmar and therefore other Asian member countries have to help the country resolve this. Excellencies, distinguished speakers and participants, with reference to the topic of this webinar, which apart from seeking a regional solution, also tries to discuss the international solution to the Myanmar crisis. The delicate question is what steps will be undertaken by the international community and how will this be implemented to overcome the enduring crisis in Myanmar. From our side, we at Jababeka Group have established a long collaboration with the Indonesian Council on World Affairs. Before the outbreak of the pandemic, Jabavika supported a number of its previous seminars and the support is part and parcel of our corporate social responsibility. And the outcomes of the seminars are practical and beneficial to people at large. This is even more relevant now during the pandemic. Our aim to enhance prosperity for the people of Indonesia and create harmony will be even stronger through continuous development of township and industrial estate, and by doing so, creating jobs and continuously supporting the government of Indonesia. Of course, we cannot just look at Indonesia alone. As Indonesia has become one of the largest democracies in the world, we have a responsibility surely within ASEAN to foster international peace and harmony. In line with Indonesia's Pancasila, which is a great ideology that touches on many facets, including human rights and social justice, we can promote the upholding of democracy and with that economic development and prosperity. We do not only advocate peace and harmony through Jababeka Group, but also via TIDAR, the TIDAR Heritage Foundation, a non-profit organization established by myself and like-minded individuals, mainly to promote the majestic Borobudur Temple in Central Jawa, which is a beacon of spirituality, and I suppose can stand symbol for the peace and harmony we so desperately need in today's day and age. In closing, I would like to say that it is my fervent hope that we will have fruitful discussion this afternoon, and the outcome of the webinar will become the contribution in the resolution of the current Myanmar crisis, which at the later stage, will undoubtedly be strengthening the unity and cohesiveness. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Darmono. Uh, next is the opening address by His Excellency Professor Dr. Makareng Wibisono, who was also the former Indonesian representative to, U to the United Nations in New York and Geneva. The screen is yours, Professor Makareng. His Excellency, Lieutenant General, retired Agus Wijoyo, Governor of the National Research Institute, His Excellency, Minister Siddhartha and Suryo Dipuro, Director General for ASEAN Cooperation, 
His Excellency Mr. Mazuki Darusman, former Attorney General of Indonesia, distinguished Dr. Philip Fermonte, the Executive Director of CSIS, Mr. S.D. Darmono, President Director of Jababeka and co-host of today's event, Ernst and Young and FPCI, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the Indonesian Council of World Affairs, Ichwa, I would like to thank the distinguished speaker for participating in the panel discussion. Secondly, I would like to thank everyone that is logged on to the event remotely. Though the pandemic forces us to be physically distant from each other, it also boosts humanity capacity through technology and connecting to one another from anywhere across the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, since its beginning, Myanmar has struggled with military rule, civil war, global isolation, and economic development problems. In the year 2011, the military junta was dissolved, giving way to a military installed transitional government. This ushered in what many would believe is a new era for the country. The country long-time opposition party, the National League for Democracy, NLD, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, was won majorities in both chambers of parliament in the year 2015. Foreign government and companies that had previously signed Myanmar began developing ties with it. Yet, the military known as the Muftat Madaw has continued to dominate many aspects of domestic affairs. Military and civilian leaders, including Aung San Suu Kyi, have also faced international criticism for their ongoing policy toward the Rohingya in the Western state of Rakhine. The last election conducted months ago brought about an impressive outcome that saw NLD led by Aung San Suu Kyi won majorities. The election has been criticized by the military due to its supposedly many irregularities. Sensing their continuously mandated duty to ensure that elections are well conducted, the military took power and Aung San Suu Kyi and other NLD leaders were jailed. This manifestation of a self-interpreting of such a constitutional duty surprised everyone. Consequently, civilian demonstrations spread all over Myanmar against what many interpret as a coup d'etat that took place. Based on media coverage, more than 200 civilians were killed during the social disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, so why was ASEAN created? For various reasons, as we are astutely aware. But let me be simple. ASEAN origin were clearly set out in the Bangkok Declaration of 1967 that provide for the need to foster, and I quote, good understanding, good neighborliness, and meaningful cooperation among the countries of the region already bound together by ties of history and culture, end quote. The declaration has stressed the need to foster social cultural development in the region. It does not take long to realize that as we go some 50 years back to the Bangkok Declaration, that the ASEAN vision cover not only countries, but peoples in particular. How come 
Well, politics and security are in the realm of countries. So are economics and development. But socioculturalism are deeply ingrained within the citizenry of Southeast Asia. Such development is jointly fostered yeah. through the spirit of equality and partnership. But for what purpose? To essentially strengthen the foundation for a prosperous and peaceful community of Southeast Asian nation. These issues are to be discussed in this discussion. Therefore, I express my great appreciation once again to the distinguished speaker. A special appreciation is due to Ambassador Siddhartha Soyodipuro for his delivery of the keynote speech of Foreign Minister Rat Ratno Marsudi, whom regrettably could not be present as originally scheduled due to previously unforeseeable urgent commitment. Despite the crisis posed by the pandemic, the foreign minister undertook bold initiative to extensively conduct subtle diplomacy in personally engaging with the foreign minister of Southeast Asia to seek ways and means to mitigate the crisis in Myanmar. Given such relentless pursuit of peace and restoration of democracy and rule of law in an ASEAN country, I believe the foreign minister's keynote speech would surely captivate and inspire us on how the situation in Myanmar could be resolved. Last but not least, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Mr. Denis Suryo to shall moderate this discussion. And Ambassador Ibrahim Yusuf, as well as Ambassador Chandra Salim and Lilis for the effort that made, that made the webinar possible. I wish a successful and productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Makarim. Before the keynote address of Indonesian Foreign Minister, we will show a three minute video presentation by Jababeka. Please. Aman, Bu Aman. Yeah, enggak. What is the measure of a developed country? For Jababeka, it is to empower individuals, businesses, and communities to realize their potential, to create self-sustained modern cities in each province in Indonesia, and provide employment opportunities for better life. Our journey began in 1989. What everybody saw as a bleak industrial land and a ghost town, we saw as a hidden potential. After a quarter century of building, Jabba Becca is now one of the biggest township developers in Southeast Asia. We have achieved numerous awards and milestones, and so enable thousands of businesses to thrive and raise the standards of living. Jabba Becca has three pillars of business, land and property development, infrastructure, as well as leisure and hospitality. Each area is developed with its own unique master plan to maximize the potential of every land to become a fully functioning city. Kota Jababeka Chikaram, as the first, largest and most successful township in Indonesia, has the competitive advantage of comprehensive expertise in industrial, residential, commercial, and mixed-use development. Tanjung Lesung Special Economic Zone, strategically located on the shoreline of the Indian Ocean with warm equatorial sunshine, is an ideal tourism-driven township. 
its high accessibility supported with a great natural beauty, as well as extensive facilities and world-class hospitality, will ensure its place as a national tourism hotspot. Kendall Industrial Park, an integrated industry-based township in central Java. Designed to support manufacturers in increasing productivity, it offers great connectivity and strategic location, international standard infrastructure and amenities, as well as skilled and competitive labor. Moratai Special Economic Zone is an ambitious and visionary plan to develop eastern Indonesia. With favorable climate and strategic location, Moratai has the potential to be an important new hub in the region. With the rise of Indonesia's economy, we continue to push forward for new opportunities. We aim to create 100 cities in Indonesia to answer the need for integrated urban townships across the nation. Now, we continue our journey through a combination of visionary insight, strategic planning, and focused execution. With strong collaboration and support from the government and strategic partners, we can realize our goal of creating employment opportunities for a better life and empowered Indonesia. What is the measure of a developer? Uh, thank you, Jabba Beka Group. Next is our main keynote address of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, delivered by His Excellency Mr. Siddhartha Suryudipuro, the Director General for ASEAN Cooperation. He will only deliver the keynote address and will not be one of the panelists, but substantially uh, his substance of the keynote address is already covered his presentation. Thank you. The screen is yours, uh, Director General. Yang terhormat, Bapak Darmono dari Japa, Japa BK. Yang terhormat, uh, Bapak Duta Besar Makarim Bibisono. Uh, yang kami hormati, Bapak Marzuki Darusman. Uh, Bapak Dubes Chandra Salim dan Bapak Deni Suryo yang memoderasi acara ini. Yang terhormat Bapak Letjen Agus Wijoyo, Gubernur Lemhanas. Uh, yang kami hormati Bapak Philip Formonte, Direktur Eksekutif CSIS, Bapak dan Ibu, para peserta webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. I have the honor and pleasure to represent Her Excellency Ratno Marsudi, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, to speak before this webinar. Minister Marsudi expresses her regrets for not being able to address this important event in person. She sends her greetings and she sends a message that hopefully all of you remain healthy and compliant with all health protocols. Allow me to extend on behalf of Minister Marsudi appreciation to the governing board of ICHWA for the timely holding of this webinar. Allow me to speak not only on the very important issue of the recent situation in Myanmar, but also to invite ICHWA and the participants to think about the role and future of ASEAN. When the military took over the control of the government of Myanmar on 1st of February and repudiated the outcome of the November 2020 elections, all of us in Southeast Asia and the international community were caught with a mixed set of feelings, mainly shock, disbelief, and disappointment. The promise that Myanmar made since it joined ASEAN in 1997 thus seemed even further away than ever before. The promise of endeavoring towards common norms and behavior as an ASEAN member state, especially after all of us agreed in the early years of the second millennium to establish an ASEAN community, 
with its three pillars. As Ambassador Makarim Bibisono mentioned uh, at the outset, and after the entry into force of the ASEAN Charter, the promise of all ASEAN member states working to, towards ASEAN unity and centrality, the promise of ASEAN economic integration, and the promise of strengthening a common ASEAN identity. The shock and disappointment grew into exasperation and deep frustration when civilians began to die in the streets and disappeared into detention by the actions of the authorities. ASEAN's response was immediate. On 1st of February, the chair of ASEAN issued a statement on the basis of discussion with all ASEAN member states. In a climate of uncertainty, a situation on the ground was unclear and evolving, the chair's statement provided guidance to ASEAN member states. It also provided something that the international community can rally around. Foreign Minister Ratno Matsudi was at front and center in the diplomatic effort in the region and beyond. She was and continues to be in communication with foreign ministers of ASEAN member states, with key countries beyond the region, with the United Nations, with other key organizations and personalities. The shuttle diplomacy that Minister Ratno undertook in February to Brunei, Singapore, and Thailand helped to lay the groundwork for the informal ASEAN foreign ministers meeting that subsequently took place at er earlier this month on March the 2nd. The informal AMM is significant in at least three ways. That the group called for cessation of violence, the exercise of restraint for the parties to seek peaceful solution through dialogue and reconciliation and reiteration of ASEAN's readiness to assist in a positive, peaceful, and constructive manner. That the group's position in a period of one month since outbreak of this situation has evolved significantly to come together with common views. And it was for one ASEAN state, Myanmar, to listen, to understand, and to respond to the views of the other nine ASEAN member states. And finally, it was significant that a significant number of ASEAN member states, including Indonesia, made clear their views that this situation is detrimental to regional stability. As the regions bridge with the international community, there are high hopes that ASEAN will be able to work out a solution for Myanmar. It could be recalled that ASEAN's role as an intermediary between the region and the international community is not new. ASEAN has done so quite successfully in the past, not, not only on Myanmar, but on a, on a host of other issues. Indonesia too, on its part, benefited from such an ASEAN role among them in the form of the deployment of peace monitors in the implementation of the Aceh peace process. Today, the UN Security Council, the UN Human Rights Commission, Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council, ASEAN's partners and major powers, civil society, and various other organizations supported ASEAN's effort to find a resolution. These have been expressed openly as well as through diplomatic channels. We understand that their support cannot be taken for granted and it is not being taken for granted. We enjoy their support because of the credibility that ASEAN has built over time. It is a support based on ASEAN's past ability to resolve regional issues. And this support has to be earned and much work lies ahead of us for all ASEAN member states. Foreign Minister Ratno Marsudi, on her part, understands this well, and she continues to work the phones and through virtual and physical meetings to maintain and build the support. Out of concern for the humanitarian situation in Myanmar and the impact this situation is having on the future of the country, as well as regional security and prosperity. President Yoko Widodo last week called for a meeting of ASEAN leaders. 
He spoke with the chairman of ASEAN, His Majesty Sultan Bolkiah of Brunei Darussalam earlier this week. And hopefully such a meeting will take place in due course. A number of consideration merit further thought. How to stop violence and start dialogue leading to peace. All sides must show flexibility to allow this to take shape. ASEAN has offered its services. Is this situation undermining ASEAN's effectiveness as an institution? ASEAN's enduring purposes and goals in any field have been reached through a process of working together. The Myanmar unrest have created a host of institutional issues, which in the past were considered as procedural matters, but no, no longer. Is the situation impacting the centrality of ASEAN? ASEAN centrality is key in the maintenance of regional stability and security amidst the treacherous eddies of great power politics. If Myanmar's internal problem continues to exist, major competing powers may use this situation against the competing powers and thus provide centrifugal force to ASEAN centrality. Is the situation leading to instability in the region? Myanmar crisis may exacerbate not only the Rohingya situation, it may prompt refugees to flow to neighboring countries looking for safety. We are already seeing early indications of this. Finally, is this situation derailing economic aspirations? Myanmar's economy is facing challenges to the extent that it may be paralyzed, as there are signs of banking crisis as well as falling investment. As an important part of the ASEAN economic community, the situation in Myanmar could hamper ASEAN's regional economic integration. The aforementioned situations are among those that an ASEAN summit may have to address. For Indonesia, the outcomes of such a summit must provide clarity on how ASEAN would address the situation in Myanmar in the spirit of non-interference, as well as the purposes, principles, and provisions of the ASEAN Charter, and in the spirit of ASEAN family and ASEAN community. For its part, Myanmar needs to have the opportunity to inform the other ASEAN member states how it intends to fulfill its obligations under the ASEAN Charter and responsibilities to achieve an ASEAN community. The Myanmar situation is unprecedented and what we today, what we do today will set precedence. Therefore, we have to make it right. As we do this, we will also help address a number of key questions for ASEAN's future. Questions such as the strengthening of ASEAN unity and centrality in the face of continuing dynamics within and beyond the region. The question of ASEAN institutional capacity to take up greater responsibilities for achieving the vision of an ASEAN community, as, as well as for contributing to a more peaceful and prosperous Indo-Pacific. The question of ASEAN decision-making process, which while consensus remain a mainstay of ASEAN, it rec recognizing the different paces that ASEAN member states may move. At the same time, there is also recognition of the many approaches that ASEAN can take that would ev eventually lead to consensus. And finally, the question of ASEAN's preparedness for the challenge of the future as the region faces an increasingly number of cross-border issues as well as issues requiring regional and international cooperation. Issues such as climate change, global warming, rising sea level, fresh water, as well as man-made and natural disasters. Myanmar, as are all ASEAN member states, is a key part of ASEAN family. As in any family, each, members, each member has rights, obligations, and responsibilities. Myanmar will benefit from a region that is stable 
peaceful and prosperous in the midst of geopolitical and geoeconomic tensions. Together with ASEAN, Myanmar will develop and strengthen unique identity as part of Southeast Asia, more than just an extension of the great civilizations of China and India. With its uniqueness, Myanmar would go hand in hand with other ASEAN member states and push the organization to continuously readjust itself so as to stay relevant and to realize the ASEAN community. All ASEAN member states have choices to make. We each have to think about our national interests and balance them with our regional interests and responsibilities. These should not be seen as contradictory. The beauty of ASEAN is that it has been able to turn one of the most diverse and tense regions into a, one successful grouping and community. It has made countless adjustments so as to give life to the ASEAN dream, the dream we aspire for our region. I believe that this webinar will help us in contributing to the train of thoughts and proceed fruitfully. Hence, I thank you and let us meet again in other fruitful occasions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Siddhartha Suryudipuro for delivering Minister's keynote speech. Now we come to our main event, presentations by the speakers. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Denis Suryo will moderate the presentation and discussions. And Mr. Denis Suryo was a former member in the board of directors of the Financial Club. Before we get into the main event, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we did that already. Now, uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Denis Suryo. Thank you, Ambassador Chandra Salim. Here, I would like to acknowledge again His Excellency Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo, and also His Excellency Mr. Siddhartha Suryo Dipuro. And we have also here our distinguished panelist, um, His Excellency Mr. Marzuki Darusman, and um, our distinguished panelist among us is Dr. Philip J. Fromonte. First of all, uh, we also would like to welcome all the panelists and also the webinar participants. And I have just been told by the committee, our numbers have gone up, uh, Ambassador Chandra, since when you have already announced that we are now already at 503. And we are very pleased that this is the second, the second event that we have with Ichwa, Indonesian Council on World Affairs. And we are also very happy to note that there are more than 40 countries uh, participating with us uh, in this webinar. Now, before I would like to uh, introduce again the panelist speakers, here and um, also would like to comment uh, some of the things that the welcoming remarks uh, by um, also uh, Mr. Darmono and also His Excellency Professor Dr. Makarin Wibisono, which he had mentioned earlier, and I also would like to acknowledge um, for the uh, beginning part of the program. Now, we will hear the, from the panelists some presentations from each of the, uh, the speakers, and there will be three for us. Each will provide uh, roughly about 20 minutes. And then after that, we will have a question and answer sessions. Uh, due to the limited, uh, I think, capacity that we have and also the, the, the numbers of participants in this webinar, as I mentioned before, the way we are going to do the question and answer sessions that we will uh, read out the question and answer sessions that will be provided to us and hopefully the participants can include this in the chat either through the zoom or in the uh, in the YouTube chat that we that also is on the right panel of your screen. So without further ado, I would like to first of all ask for the first speaker here His Excellency Mr. Marzuki Darusman and as mentioned earlier by our host, 
He is the former Attorney General of the Republic of Indonesia. He is also the former Chair for the UN International Independent Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar. We couldn't have one of the best resources in, on this subject matter, and he will be talking about the perspectives on human rights and democracy in Myanmar. Pak uh, Marzuki, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, Denny, moderator, and uh, thank you to Ambassador uh, Chandra Salin and Ambassador uh, Makarim for the opening uh, words. Uh, a special mention, of course, to Minister Ratno Masudi for delivering, uh, for presenting a, a keynote uh, that was delivered by uh, Director General of ASEAN, uh, Mr. Sidato. I will not be perhaps taking 20 minutes, uh, any, uh, maybe less than that, uh, for the benefit of other speakers, but also primarily for allowing the Q&A to, to get more time. Uh, and, and thank you, thanking uh, with you also uh, the, the attendees for, uh, for uh, attending this uh, webinar uh, from all, all over the world. Uh, quite an impressive number of, uh, of attendees. Now, uh, taking my cue from what the minister uh, as mentioned in her keynote, uh, and picking up the the sense of uh, of how uh, ASEAN and uh, the world, in fact, uh, around the, in the around the globe, have uh, addressed this uh, this uh, crisis in in Myanmar. The words such as shock, disappointment, exasperation sums up the, uh, the mood at the moment. Uh, it also against a background of uh, the last tally that we've uh, been able to, to pick up, uh, almost uh, 300 Myanmar citizens have been killed over the past uh, 40 days. And uh, so uh, the figures speak for themselves. It, it, is, it is now becoming uh, a model of what in the international uh, human rights domain is known as industrial killing. And, and that is to, to uh, effect a minimum number of, uh, if I can use the term, to produce the minimum number of uh, victims, uh, to reach a level of uh, production that could deter the civil disobedient movement from continuing. Uh, so that, that is where we are at the moment. Now, uh, obviously, the, the, the crisis will be unfolding further uh, in, in the coming days, weeks, months, years for that matter. And therefore, I'm proposing uh, perhaps not to, to uh, uh, impress that we may have a solution soon, but perhaps uh, a, best, a better way of going forward would be to present uh, a perspective. And that is what, what, what uh, the organizers have asked me to, to do in terms of uh, looking at the human rights and democracy uh, dimensions. Uh, there will be four, four main uh, issues here to encapsulate uh, what is uh, happening there and to, to be able to understand what is, what is, what is uh, unfolding. 
Uh, one is that uh, history matters. And if, if I can have the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint uh, screen, if, if, if that is possible, uh, Balilis. Uh, within this, this rubric, uh, I, I would propose that uh, the situation in Myanmar is not seen as a process of change, but more a process of uh, what is no, known as a metamorphosis. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's not a transition because there are two uh, elements that go into this, and that is uh, a change, but also resilience of uh, uh, remaining elements from the past. And, and therefore, it is always a push and pull, uh, uh, one step uh, forward and then a half step, or even one step back again. And, uh, and it continues indefinitely until we have a, a changed, uh, a completely transformed situation in, in Myanmar. Now, it's important to, to understand what is it that we're dealing with here in, in, in Myanmar. We are dealing with a weaponized dictatorial force that is in possession of a state. It is an army with a state. It is not a state with an army, to be sure. It's the other way around. And that has been uh, the accumulated uh, process of almost 70 years now since 1947, since Myanmar acquired independence. And, and therefore, uh, some people say it's that the army is a state, not quite. Because this is an important uh, aspect. The army is not the state by the very fact that the state, according to international law, has three elements, government, territory, and the people. The territory is not under the armed forces uh, purview. It is with the ethnic armed organizations. The people is not with the army. It is with the people. It is with the CDM, it is with the CRPH, it is with the General Strike Committee and the whole range of civil society movements in the country at the moment. And the government is now being contested by a element which is emerging to become the government of Myanmar. We can go into that a bit later. Now, uh, within this rubric of history matters, uh, uh, there's the claim by the armed forces, the Tatmadaw, it, it is known as the Tatmadaw, that they are guardians of the nation. What nation are we uh, talking about here? Because the nation consists of all ethnic groups and the Tatmadaw is no less, no more, an ethnic armed organizations of the dominant ethnic group, the Bamars. So in no way that can the Tatmadaw, which is an ethnic armed organization of the Bama ethnic group, represent Myanmar as a whole. And this goes to the point of the issue of recognition or not recognition of the junta. The junta cannot be recognized as representing Myanmar as a whole because it is no more than an ethnic armed organization. Fine. Secondly, there has been a political involution in the country. The military has offered what they call a disciplined flourishing democracy as a concept uh, of civilianization in process. This goes back to 50 years ago. Uh, since the uh, coup d'etat, uh, the first coup d'etat that led to the, to the uh, military government up until uh, today. On the other hand, the people and the ethnic armed organizations have a counter concept, which is called federal democracy. And so this has been the conflict all along within the country with regard to the model of, a, of the Myanmar state and nation in the future. And what has emerged in the meantime, of course, is that 
uh, over the past uh, years, when graduated democratization took place, with elections being won by the NLD, overwhelmingly in 2020 and uh, discounted and uh, announced by the regime, uh, a new element, a new element has come into the picture. And this is what is known as uh, parliamentary politics. Uh, we can go into that uh, later in the Q&A because this is a, a very interesting process that is uh, underway, which may bode well for the future of Myanmar. Thirdly, uh, you have the number, the, the first uh, posting here. Uh, can I have the number three, please? Arrested development. Thirdly, the dimension of uh, the uh, issue of arrested development. I'm uh, subtitling this uh, particular uh, rubric with, uh, to begin with, with the term trial and terror. Yeah. Uh, with a view to present to you uh, that what has now been deployed in terms of operational uh, actions in the in uh, in the underground is the uh, light infantry di the division LID number thirty three and seventy seven, infamous for having committed gross atrocities against the Rohingyas in twenty seventeen. This is the these are the very same LIDs that are being deployed against the people of Myanmar. Uh, you can imagine what will happen. If you just take a look at what took place in 2017 with one and a half million uh, refugees now in uh, Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. Now, what is happening there is clearly crimes against humanity. And this applies only to the period between February 1 until now. We're not even talking about uh, the, the uh, transgressions, violations and crimes that is now being being looked into by the independent investigative uh, mechanism for Myanmar that is still working on the basis of the fact-finding missions uh, uh, work of uh, 2019, which has allegedly qualified what took place in 2017 as genocidal. Uh, the frontal attack against uh, civilians the systematic headshot killings uh, point to the uh, systematic systematization and the massive uh, atrocities that is uh, be, being committed by the uh, Tatmadaw. And a, a third sub-item within arrested development is what I would say the death line, which is May or June. We have been able to pick up uh, information that the Tatmadaw will be escalating their actions and that therefore the, uh, the plan is to finalize everything to clamp down on what is happening there by the month of May or June at which time the Tatmadaw traditionally go back to their villages to recuperate and to uh, uh, retrain for the next phase of their uh, service uh, as of uh, May or June uh, on. And so uh, the sense is that by May and June or early June, that will be not the deadline, but the death line. Finally, uh, just to give a sense of the end game. This is number four, uh, Marilis. Uh, the overall approach would be perhaps to look at the situation there uh, in, in, in terms of the, the, the Latin uh, saying, Festina lente, meaning uh, we should make haste, but slowly. We should make 
quick decisions, but try to be as inclusive as possible in moving forward. And therefore, uh, a major issue to be addressed by the Myanmar people would be to revisit their vision of their nationalism. Uh, this is uh, a key element that will have to be addressed by all the ethnic groups in uh, Myanmar to be able to uh, set out on a platform that is in inclusive as possible, that would include also the Rohingyas, and therefore uh, conversations with uh, people on the ground, with uh, the movement, uh, do point to the direction that uh, a, a new constitution, constitution will have to be uh, crafted on the basis of a <clears throat> collective view and vision of what Myanmar nationalism is going to uh, be understood. And, and finally, of course, uh, we will have to address the twin issue of geopolitics versus geography, starting, of course, with the, the China question and uh, looking at durable solutions uh, by ASEAN and uh, beyond. I will end there, uh, moderator, and, uh, and uh, would certainly be happy to, to uh, address uh, any, any queries, any questions and answers uh, and uh, uh, discussions uh, later on. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Marzuki. So we have pretty much got an insight, um, among other things, the evolution, the arrested development. And it's interesting that uh, Pat Marzuki Darusman mentioned this is totally a ethnic arm organization. However, he had also elaborated on the end game plan, Pestina Lente, make haste slowly. So for our next speaker or from the, from the panelists, uh, we have Dr. Philip Formente and Dr. Philip Formente is from the executive director for Center for Strategic and International Studies. His subtopic here would be the role of external powers in the resolution of Myanmar. So this would be quite interesting what his views are on how the outside world looks at uh, the Myanmar conflict. Uh, Dr. Phyllis Formante, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, moderator, uh, Denis Suryo. And then uh, I would also like to thank uh, Indonesian Council of World Affairs for inviting me hmm. to come to this uh, timely uh, webinar uh, on the pressing issues that uh, have been seemingly have been very difficult to tackle uh, by Indonesia and also by ASEAN and uh, probably also by the international community. Uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Pak Marzuki Darusman mentioned earlier that uh, especially uh, about the military in, in Myanmar. They, had been, uh, they have been in power for, <clears throat> for too long and then the, uh, about 60 years, I guess. And that uh, in itself <clears throat> make it very difficult for a uh, solution uh, between now the people of uh, Myanmar and the Tat Madaw because uh, of that political fact uh, somehow uh, Tat Madaw must be in the picture of uh, the, the solution as well. But the current situation make it very difficult uh, on the part of the civilian and the people because of the killing and the shootings and so on to uh, provide some room of flexibility uh, entertaining the idea that somehow Tatmadaw must be part of the solution. So if that is the case, <clears throat> what would be uh, the, 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 the end game of uh, the situation in Myanmar and uh, how the international community, especially uh, ASEAN in this regard, uh, can play a role? 
in uh, trying to help uh, to find the solution in Myanmar. Because uh, as we also believe in Indonesia, in this kind of situation, uh, hopefully and uh, preferably solution should come from within. Because otherwise, uh, if it is uh, imposed by the outside power, then it might not be long lasting. And given the situation, as Pak Marzuki Darusman already mentioned, there are armed ethnic group in Myanmar that would also be uh, another factor to count in. So I think there are at least five or six scenarios of <clears throat> uh, the, the, the likely outcome. Some are possible, the other one requires uh, other factors uh, to be in, in order uh, to be successful. First of all, of course, uh, before all these scenarios uh, uh, I will be discussing, uh, shootings and violence, uh, of course, should stop. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to be a workable environment for both sides uh, to sit down and negotiate because uh, we've been experiencing this as well in Indonesia, in Aceh, in, 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 in Aceh during the, the, the period of uh, in the 80s and 90s. It is going to be very difficult if violence continue to take place and then the, uh, any discussion or possible solution, political negotiation will be difficult to maintain. And secondly, I think there are about five scenarios. Number one, the reconciliation scenarios. And uh, this involves uh, from the civilian side, CRPH uh, in this uh, regard, uh, for sure they, sh they will call, the highest call for them is the uh, transfer of power back to the elected officials that the Tatmadaw uh, annulled uh, in February. Second highest call for the civilian, uh, for the pro from the side of the people in Myanmar, of course, the release of political prisoners, including the Wang San Suu Kyi. And then the <clears throat> change of the constitution uh, to be uh, democratically based and, and the demand for uh, federal uh, democracy in Myanmar. It seems that uh, if the other side is accepting this condition, they might also have some demands because it is a matter of survival as well for the military. Uh, they might demand amnesty for the military after all the shootings and killings. And then the, of course, these are a very hard call for both sides right now. Uh, and uh, they would not accept it publicly. That's why I think uh, some uh, groundwork, uh, not on the public discussion should be conducted, either facilitated by ASEAN or from uh, both sides within Myanmar. But to have this discussed publicly, I think it's non-starter for them. And uh, that's why uh, I think the, the summit would provide a good venue for, for ASEAN and for both sides because uh, hopefully if the groundwork is done, they would uh, trust ASEAN to have this scenario of reconciliation. Scenario number two, after all this discussion take place, uh, it is very important to imagine what would be the outcome. First one is gonna be power sharing between parties in Myanmar. Uh, this is difficult scenario to accept probably by the people because they completely wanted the military to get out of politics right now, right away in Myanmar. So <clears throat> this needs to be discussed with some flexibilities if this is going to be an accepted scenario for both sides in Myanmar. Scenario, uh, the next scenario would be uh, the, the, the Thai scenario. What, uh, remember, we remember what happened in, in Thailand 
when the military took over power, uh, that is the NLD or CRPH will not take power. Uh, Tat Madao will also not be in power and there will be third party. Wherever that be, that is the question that both sides need to uh, answer. <clears throat> so that some uh, individuals or figures in Myanmar, we should identify, it will be acceptable by both sides. And then the third scenario, this is uh, something that uh, hopefully we don't have to do is the R2P scenario. Uh, when the international community coming in, uh, if violence continues and then the killings continues and number of victims uh, grow up and, and so on. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, all sides in Myanmar probably, although maybe <clears throat> rhetorically, rhetorically they call for internationally, uh, international uh, community to come in, but uh, this is also going to be very difficult for the international community. Uh, lessons abound about international intervention coming in. Uh, coming in is easy, getting out is difficult. So it, it will uh, be a burden as well for the international community. And if it is going to be through the UN mechanism, and uh, we have uh, some countries that would veto that, it seems to me. And the uh, last scenario <clears throat> would be, and this is also, I think, uh, will be difficult for the side of the people, uh, CRPH and, uh, and others, that is allowing uh, some kind of a <clears throat> interim period in Myanmar where the uh, TMD rule for a certain period of time. And during those time, discussions about the future types of election, the future types of government, and the future constitutions are being debated and discussed, probably with uh, facilitated, probably facilitated by international community. Preferably, of course, ASEAN, because <clears throat> uh, if not, then uh, ASEAN will lose some relevance uh, if uh, we are not able to help uh, uh, Myanmar. And ASEAN has a long experience actually in facilitating uh, finding uh, conflict resolutions uh, in Cambodia, in Southern Philippines, and, and some other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. ASEAN has a long history of uh, a long successful history of this kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, peaceful uh, solution uh, effort. And uh, I do hope that ASEAN would be able to, to utilize this experience. And uh, Myanmar needs to be reminded that ASEAN somehow has been friend to, uh, to the country. And uh, when uh, they were under pressure from international community, uh, ASEAN kept uh, Myanmar close and somehow facilitating the democratization process as well. But now <clears throat> uh, ASEAN needs to, to do more because the situation has been uh, as such that both sides, I think, reached the point that at this point, they would not want to negotiate. And that would require a very high skill, uh, high skill uh, approach by ASEAN uh, and also by Indonesia. If we uh, agree that Indonesia has a lot to offer uh, to Myanmar. Lastly, if I may say, <clears throat> uh, from the speech uh, that was read by Ambassador Arto earlier of the uh, our Foreign Ministry, Her Excellency Ibu Ratno. Uh, the key term, I think, is flexibility. And then the, both sides in Myanmar needed to be reminded that flexibility is required for them to achieve a workable solution. And so they should identify and should avoid non-starter uh, requirement. Uh, for example, I think right now for the people, the question of amnesty, uh, cannot be accepted and probably from the military side 
the call for federal union or federal democracy, uh, federal democratic system would also not be accepted because different from Indonesia, when we're talking about federalism, decentralization, we are not talking about a province with armed groups. Uh, in Myanmar, uh, the situation is so much different that <clears throat> this ethnic-based geography within Myanmar are coupled by the armed group that would be, I think, for military everywhere uh, to be accepted that, you know, uh, within their jurisdiction, there are arms group. So this type of thing needs to be thoroughly discussed among parties in Myanmar and for us in ASEAN to understand. Uh, that's uh, my contribution, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'll hand back the screen uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Phil Fromonte. And just trying to get some word whether our next speaker Yes, um, we have scheduled here for Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo, and we're just confirming whether he is available on, on a webinar or not. Otherwise, we can just go straight to the Q&A. Okay. Um, perhaps maybe we can start a discussion. Some questions are already coming in, and when... Yes, we, we can start with the Q&A, and if uh, uh, Agus Wijoyo uh, is available, then we can already also perhaps maybe hear some of his thoughts and his perspective as well on the uh, on Myanmar. But um, if I may uh, direct to the panelists here, uh, we've so far heard from uh, Marzuki Darusman, and then uh, we have also hear from uh, Dr. Philip Romante. Uh, perhaps maybe I need to ask uh, Dr. Philip Fromante in this situation. The election itself, it was considered a landslide back in November. Uh, the NLD here has, um, it, there, there were many international observers there, and there was also some local officials who it was, it was very much um, verified. Now, that is November 2020. Now the, the crisis has started. The military coup has started on February 1st. Now my question to you, uh, Dr. Philip Formente, is why now? How did that actually come about? I mean, we're already perhaps November, December, January, February. Uh, now we're in March. That's almost like four or five months away. What sort of prompted their, their actions? Uh, this was sort of impromptu, nobody had suspected this at all. In fact, there was a video clip of this, um, there was a, in the early morning hours where they were, they were doing some aerobics and all that, and all of a sudden they, they saw this, uh, this entourage of these you know, very official vehicles going in. So perhaps maybe if you can give us a little bit on color on what had happened that, that triggered them to actually uh, create this uh, military coup on February 1st. Uh, but, Philip Formante? Yeah, um, <clears throat> my observation is this. Uh, I think uh, what happened was, uh, and uh, uh, people who follow Myanmar issues for quite some time know that uh, the relationship between Dao Aung, Suu Kyi, Aung San Suu Kyi and the uh, junta, now junta leader, General MAH uh, had not been very cordial. Uh, they would not talk to each other and, and so on because, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, Dao Aung, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, felt that uh, the military would not relinquish power uh, regardless of the election result. And on the other hand, the distrust from the Tatma Dao against the NLD at that time also uh, quite high because losing. Uh, election uh, a landslide uh, is uh, something that for the military. <clears throat> so that's how I think uh, uh, there are individual interests of uh, the military, I think, and also the corporate interests of the military in, in Myanmar. 
because of the survival after such a long time in power, the prospect of not having power, of course, uh, triggered insecurity on the part of, uh, of the military. That's, uh, I think, <clears throat> uh, the, the trigger of the, of, of the coup. Secondly, though, <clears throat> I think the institutional setup uh, is as such in Myanmar that would guarantee the, <laughs> the military to lose power through election. Uh, because uh, as far as I, uh, I know about the electoral system in, in Myanmar, uh, that they are adopting the first past the post uh, electoral system uh, that would guarantee the Tatmadaw to lose election because you know it's kind of a winner takes all uh, votes. So if you get the most of the votes in, in one particular district that you will win the seats from that district. And uh, in the popularity contest like that, of course, uh, NLD would uh, have a better chance of winning the election and the military would certainly lose the, the, the election because they are not popular. And NLD with Dao Aung San Suu Kyi and others has been very popular. So from their side as well, I think uh, they did not anticipate that such an institutional setup would <clears throat> make them lose the power. And that's why I think <clears throat> for uh, it is not acceptable because this is a greed uh, electoral system that the, uh, the, the uh, Myanmarese people have been adopting and the military is just, I think, has been outsmarted by the civilian on that particular issue. And that's how I think they caught, probably they are not caught by surprise, but they know that the, they would lose uh, election completely because the election, the electoral system does not favor uh, the Tatmadaw. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll come back on that one. Um, there is a question that came about, and this is directed to Pak Marzuki Darusman. Uh, this is a question from James Bannon. He's from the Universitas Nacional. His question is, the, how is the rising instability in the ASEAN region, such as the Myanmar coup by the Tatmadaw, uh, impacts the ASEAN regional building, especially economic and political integration in the region? I think this was pretty much touched upon uh, by the Director General uh, as well in the beginning. Uh, any, any thoughts on that, uh, Pak Marzuki? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, moderator, and thank you, but James, for the the question. I, I think this goes to the heart of the of the issue. Uh, ASEAN, uh, as uh, laid out by the minister, considers that what is happening in in Myanmar is not an internal issue. It has moved from uh, being one among some of the members earlier in the first days after February 1, but it has uh, markedly shifted to a, a position, a collective position of calling for a, a, a resolution, a, a dialogue and, and, uh, and a peaceful uh, settlement. Uh, within the context of uh, peace and stability, peace and harmony, if I get caught well the the term that was used by the Director General uh, in the speech. Uh, the, the, the very fact that this is being uh, qualified as a peace and uh, harmony and, and stability issue in the region uh, underlines the fact, emphasizes the, 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 uh, the fact that uh, this is clearly a, a matter that impacts on ASEAN as a whole. Uh, initially, of course, uh, before we go into the economics and, and the social issues, uh, the, the, the very fact that what is happening in Myanmar, if allowed uh, to take its course, will uh, constitute a precedent in the area, in the region, and, and therefore uh, unacceptable uh, actions 
uh, would erode the standing of uh, ASEAN. Uh, but more so, it would signal to other ASEAN states uh, that these kinds of issues, uh, these kinds of actions are internal affairs, and that uh, the standard of behavior of governments will have to be uh, adjusted uh, uh, down to the level of the, the lowest common denominator uh, of observance of human rights and democracy. And th therefore, uh, it, it cannot be uh, an internal issue because it can happen to any other ASEAN countries that have more or less the, the same uh, composition, makeup, uh, national makeup of, of a nation. It, it, is, it is diverse uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, rightly so, uh, ASEAN will have to uh, express concern about what is happening inside there because it could spill over into the into the region as a whole, and and therefore uh, the issue of uh, uh, people uh, flowing out in droves uh, across the region. Uh, migrants uh, and asylum seekers is is a is a scenario not to not to uh, to, to be com contemplated uh, uh, lightly, uh, and therefore uh, there is a direct connection between what is happening now in Myanmar and the possibility that it might create instability in the region as a whole, and therefore uh, create a context where. Uh, economic development and growth uh, may be affected because uh, investments might take a second look in, in going into this region uh, to do business. And, and on and on it goes on. There's a chain reaction until uh, it, it, uh, it uh, uh, hits a wall where uh, if nothing is done very early now, it will then become a much more complex issue uh, in the future. Yeah. Uh, but Marzuki, I just perhaps maybe pick up on that. You know, most of us, if we're old enough, have seen what has transpired in 19, 1989. <laughs> Some of us can remember that, where the, the military junta actually, you know, brutally suppressed a pro-democracy movement. And in fact, it was that time as I recall, they've actually changed the, the, the name of the country from Burma to Myanmar. And this was uh, more or less as a way to uh, provide you know, better image. And also, now I see this happen in the private sector where they actually rebrand themselves in a way. Airlines do this, uh, a, a lot of companies actually do this because, uh, on a crisis. Now, how sensitive is the military junta the Tatmadaw, in terms of you know how are they perceived by the outside world and vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis that you have mentioned that uh, you know they have a whole you know they have a big stake in a lot of the you know companies in Myanmar. There's a lot of Myanmar conglomerates who are being uh, actually dominated, and already the U.S. and uh, United Kingdom have also provided sanctions to that. So, on one hand, are they walking the talk? Uh, but at the same time, they're creating all these uh, atrocities, but yet they are very um, mindful about uh, you know, how, how they're being perceived. So uh, can you explain to me a little bit about uh, that relationship between the two? Yes, a uh, very good point. Uh, the uh, Tatmadaw uh, is certainly uh, quite sensitive in, to, in, uh, in uh, in terms of uh, their response to the uh, international community up to a point. Uh, uh, as long as uh, it doesn't affect their uh, national sovereignty, then they will entertain, uh, uh, let's say, concerns from the, from the outside. Uh, but to, uh, to be sure, uh, what took place in, 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 in 89 when uh, uh, Burma was uh, transformed into uh, Myanmar. Uh, 
countries across the region uh, changed their names. Uh, Ceylon became Sri Lanka. Uh, Siam became Thailand. Uh, all with, uh, with differing uh, considerations. In, in the case of Myanmar, it was to the credit, of course, to the uh, armed forces then that uh, Myanmar was a much more inclusive term. Uh, and and that, that, in a, that alone uh, shows that uh, certainly uh, there is concern that in, in nation building, they will have to uh, craft concepts that uh, could serve as an inclusive concept that covers and, and encompasses the whole a range of ethnic uh, uh, groups within the country. But uh, at the same time, uh, there is, of course, the, the, the concern that uh, uh, if uh, Myanmar is, uh, again, isolated, as in the past 50 years, uh, which they have been able to, uh, to uh, go through, uh, it will certainly set back what has reached, uh, what has been reached uh, in, 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 in the last 50 years in terms of graduated democratization and, and uh, the observance of human rights and the taste of uh, liberty. And therefore, uh, uh, in spite of any concern about uh, what the world uh, community thinks about Myanmar, uh, they have no choice because the people are on an irreversible course to greater democracy and greater observance of human rights. And therefore, this, this is the trajectory that the country is going to have to take in the future. Um, uh, Dr. Philip Romente, I, I wanna ask also uh, just what uh, Marzuki has just mentioned, right now, if we see the, despite the de ethnic differences that there is in the country, but it is really now a young, you know, generation, and you know, it's a very strong based young generation uh, right now that is actually uh, having these movements. You know, they're they're gathering and also they're um, creating the civil uh, disobedience and so forth. You know how influential are they, the young? Because they've, they've, most of them prob probably have never been around when the, the actual military coup uh, or the military power has has, has started in the in early 1960s. Um, how are they going to be able? Is is it going to be? I, I we we've heard about the end game and all that, and um and, and you mentioned that there must be, uh, this flexibility, but. Uh, could they have any uh, influence at all um, in the decision making, or is this mostly trying to attract the international community? For what you have mentioned, uh, some of the uh, scenarios that that you that you have alluded to uh, in the beginning. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes. This time is uh, probably different from the military crackdown uh, of the 1988 movement in in Myanmar. Uh, right now, with the social media, uh, the advance of technology, and so on, and these are people who are very uh, savvy in utilizing all the multimedia platform, mm. for sure, uh, make it very difficult for the Tatmadaw to uh, to consolidate their grips, uh, their grips on power in Myanmar. And uh, as we know, uh, because of the social media, we from the outside world know what happened uh, inside the inside Myanmar. And then the, I think this is the the modality that these young people uh, is using to fight against the the junta. Now, <clears throat> on the role of the this young group of people in Myanmar for the future solution, I think. Uh, I suspect because uh, NLD won by the landslide in, in the last election, that would mean that young voters were also uh, supporting NLD. So they are actually providing legitimacy for the NLD. And then uh, that means uh, their voices must also be uh, included in the, in the solution. But right now, as we have uh, they have not, 
and then the, we also have not uh, offering any platform for 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 discussion about how this uh, political negotiation would be carried out. <clears throat> we 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 don't know yet, but it is imperative that uh, because of this. Uh, uh, young people uh, that have been fighting uh, very hard for the freedom in Myanmar, then they need to be uh, included. And then the, I think uh, the, the former student activists in 1988, probably right now they are also divided. Some probably have already been serving in the, in, in the government. Uh, some now go back to their activism and so on. So uh, then the, the, the fight for democracy in, in Myanmar right now is really uh, relying on these uh, young people uh, on the street. But having said that, I think it is also <clears throat> uh, the responsibility for both sides though to, to, to refrain from using uh, violence. Of course, young people would risk it all, but <clears throat> from the perspective of longer term solution, I think the more uh, civilians uh, being killed uh, on the streets, the more difficult uh, to achieve a, a solution in, in Myanmar. So I think both sides have, uh, especially the Tatmadaudo, has uh, the responsibility of, 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 of refraining. And uh, some, uh, <clears throat> uh, some have already, uh, uh, I think, uh, proposed some kind of a, what we experience in Aceh, for example, the kind of a cessation of hostility agreement. And that uh, might also be uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, preliminary solution uh, for, for both sides in Myanmar to stop at least violence and then the start thinking about uh, political uh, settlement uh, so that these young people would not be the victim on the streets anymore. Yes, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, we have uh, quite a few questions here. I'm just going to read out to you. Uh, first of all, to pa Marzuki Darusman. Um, this is a question from Yuli Mumpuni Widarso. She is from the MUI Pusat. Her question is, I raised that question on Muslims in uh, Rohingya state because I observed that there are senior monks expressed support and gave blessing to the junta. Whilst we also understand that they still have problems with the Muslims in Rohingya state, I'm afraid our Muslim brothers and sisters will be treated even worse. Any thoughts on that, uh, Pak Marzuki? Pak Marzuki, are you there? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Margaret, and thank you for Yuri for the uh, question. Uh, this is, of course, uh, obviously a, 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 an issue close to our hearts uh, as a, a, a Muslim majority country, and uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't hesitate to to uh, to ask this question because it is a legitimate question and it's a valid question. Uh, and uh, people will know that if we, if uh, the, the people of Indonesia, express concern about Muslims in, in Myanmar, it is justified uh, by the sheer fact that uh, we are a majority Muslim uh, country. And, and so uh, looking at the, the situation in, in Myanmar, uh, uh, to be practical, to be practical, you know, and, and not to be speculative about things, uh, contacts with the uh, CRPH, with the Committee for Representation of uh, the, uh, the uh, Parliament. Uh, messages have been clearly delivered from all uh, sides that uh, uh, whatever settlement is reached uh, between, uh, between all sides in uh, Myanmar, that uh, it should be as inclusive as possible, encompassing all the ethnic uh, national races, uh, uh, the, the term being used in, in Myanmar. Uh, and that includes the Rohingyas and uh, uh, the Muslim Kaman, 
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as a matter of principle, uh, I think it's it's gradually accepted that that inclusiveness uh, would be uh, the only platform that, that could ensure uh, the country of, uh, and the nation moving uh, forward. But uh, then again, uh, it will have to be uh, addressed in a very uh, uh, effective way. Uh, and that is that uh, you will need, you will need a consolidation of the government uh, the, that is now emerging uh, alongside the official government, the, which is the Tatmadaw. And uh, there needs to be a unity at this very early stage and therefore a consensus uh, that uh, issues uh, that concern the nation as a whole will have to be put on the agenda to be discussed at a, an appropriate moment when uh, the crisis has somewhat subsided and uh, has become a bit more uh, manageable. And, uh, and therefore, uh, clearly, uh, the uh, future uh, of the Rohingyas and the, and the Muslims uh, are a uh, 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 inseparable element of a uh, universal settlement of the issue in, in, in Myanmar. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pat I, th I think it's also difficult because even during the time of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, period, you know, we had an outflux of about 750,000 refugees uh, living in the country. So it was also, um, I think it's, it's a very delicate situation and both sides in this case have with this Rohingya problem is, is, uh, is multi-dimensional multi in a way. Thank you, thank you for um, providing those comments. Uh, next one will be to Pat uh, Phillips uh, Fermonte. Uh, this uh, question has come from Muhammad Irza Az Azarianto. He is a uh, graduate from the University of Erlanga. Uh, I believe he's, he's a, a student there. And um, his question is reflecting on how the UN members seemingly put more attention to the Myanmar domestic disputes. For example, the US sanctions against companies that back the Myanmar military. I think I mentioned to you, it was the MEHL and the MEC. Those are the, um, just for reference for the uh, participants, these are the Myanmar conglomerates that uh, a lot of the businesses go into brewing, tobacco, and mining. They, it's, a, it's a huge business. Uh, it's, it's a huge uh, empire, in fact. So uh, should Indonesia and ASEAN members consider to apply a political or, or economic pressure on Myanmar, especially the military group? Now, that's an interesting question because, you know, have, has ASEAN ever gone into any you know, uh, sanctions to uh, member states uh, in particular. So um, any thoughts on that, uh, Philippe? Right, I think... Um, Sorry, can you repeat that again? Uh, unmute yourself, please. Okay, um, I think <clears throat> that is a very interesting question, but uh, also uh, something that uh, probably at this stage unimaginable, unimaginable for, for ASEAN because uh, ASEAN, for ASEAN to do that requires a number of things. Uh, number one, uh, there should be a consensus uh, among uh, ASEAN members that uh, uh, saying uh, the current junta is illegitimate and then, the, then they are subject to all the consequences, including uh, probably sanctions, but uh, as you noted, uh, Pak Suryo, ASEAN, uh, it's 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 going to be very difficult cost for for ASEAN member because uh, do not forget we have another junta in Thailand, and <laughs> that's a uh, that's a question of uh, uh, political legitimacy uh, in in ASEAN. 
that's I think my 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 short uh, response to a very interesting questions. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. If I may, on the Rohingya, uh, just uh, a little bit. Um, I I agree fully with what uh, has been said by Pak Marzuki Darusman. Uh, but uh, if there is any I think we're having technical problems. Any lesson for Indonesia about the Rohingya? Uh, one lesson. Uh, can you hear me, uh, moderator? Yes, we had a bit of a freeze right there. Could you uh, repeat again your answer? Right. On the Rohingya, I think if there is any lesson from that uh, sad story of the, uh, about the Rohingyas and the refugee, we should remember what happened there was a minority uh, a, a minority that is Rohingya uh, who are abused by the majority. So I think if we are reflecting back to Indonesia, then if we do not like what happened with the Rohingya as a minority in the, in the, uh, in the majority uh, of all this country, then uh, we should reflect as well about uh, how, uh, you know, uh, so many issues about our minority here that has been, has not been resolved. So otherwise, you know, uh, you know, in 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 some academic works, uh, there has been this book by Professor Stephen Krasner, saying that uh, about uh, internal conflicts uh, that happen in other countries, uh, that would force comments from other countries, that would not actually reflect uh, uh, what's going on uh, in our own country, and that uh, we as a country in ASEAN, if we want to take the lead of uh, finding solutions in Myanmar or in other places about Rohingya, about the coup, that means in Indonesia, we should also <clears throat> uh, improve uh, our treatment uh, to our minority here, as well as uh, we need to consolidate our democracy if we want to see democracy prevail in, in Myanmar. Rita, uh, I return the, the screen to you, uh, Pak Moderator. Thank you. This next question goes to Pak Marzuki Darusman um, from Abdi Mulya Lubis. He's from Yogyakarta. The question is, with regards to the Myanmar crisis, are there any strategic ways in preventing human rights or human rights relations? Would there be any dialogue between the Myanmar government and the junta military of Myanmar? Strategic ways in preventing human rights relations would there be any dialogue between uh, Myanmar government and the junta military of Myanmar? Uh, is there, is there, when is any opportunity uh, during these crises for both sides to actually sit down and have a, a dialogue? I, I guess that's, that's really what the question is. Pat uh, Marzuki. Yes. Uh, 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 moderator and then uh, Masabi. Uh, what, what is happening, of course, in, in Myanmar uh, is, is, a, a, is a direct uh, and frontal assault on human rights and democracy. And uh, therefore, it, it, is the, it, is, it, is, it is the essence of uh, what is uh, taking place. Therefore, uh, to, to be more practical about this, uh, let's, let's get down to, uh, to basics. Uh, there has been a, a history of, uh, of violations in, in Myanmar for the last uh, seven to eight decades. Yeah? Uh, things have somewhat eased uh, after the coup d'etat in 1988 that led to the election and uh, a, a loosening of the restrictive political system, uh, which uh, in a way has uh, allowed the civil society to flourish, yeah, to, to, uh, to, to grow. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, freedom of expression, of assembly, 
uh, was was allowed uh, up to a point, uh, but there was a there was a gradual loosening up of of uh, of things there in, in Myanmar. Now, fast forward to uh, 2021, 2020, uh, February 1 now, is, is the fact that, uh, again, uh, the, the metaphor of a metamorphosis rather than a transition applies here. Uh, the, the, the drive to move forward uh, is being held back uh, by residual elements of regression. And, and so we will always have this, this push and pull uh, within the, within the uh, society of, of moving forward and, uh, and, uh, and slowing down, if you will. Yeah? Now, if there's going to be any kind of discussion or dialogue, whatever you call it, uh, it will obviously be, have to be uh, undertaken subsequent uh, to a complete cessation of violence in the country. And uh, this could be in the form of, of uh, release of the prisoners uh, being detained, the, the state council, the president, the 300, 3 million, uh, 3,000 uh, detainees, youth in the prisons. Uh, 30,000 uh, former prisoners have been released to make room for new detentions from the, uh, from the civil disobedience movement. Can you imagine that? So uh, let's, not, let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Uh, as commendable as dialogue on, on human rights is uh, can be uh, between both sides. The reality, of course, is that we need to have the conditions for, for any kind of interaction within the country. And, and uh, at, at the moment, of course, we will have to address what is happening there. And therefore, going back to February 1 and, ex and trying to explain why it took place is a very slippery slope. Mm. It, it leads us to explanation and it deflects our attention for what is happening and what has happened because uh, what took place in, on February 1 uh, did take place on a, such a scale that is unjustifiable whatever the cause that prompted the action to be taken by the military on that very day. It, it is so... Uh, imbalanced, disproportional, and therefore unjustified from wherever you look at it. And therefore, uh, the, the conditions have to be, uh, to be created. And I don't think, I don't think that it can be immediately uh, shaped out by the Myanmar uh, government or people themselves, it may it may require a mediation effort from outside, and that's why it is important for ASEAN to keep on pushing and engaging the Myanmar government, the the the, the junta and the uh, uh, the Tatmadaw uh, to reach a point. Uh, sooner than later, where they see that uh, further actions uh, that have been taken so far will, will, uh, will just be uh, in, uh, futile. And uh, one precautionary note I would say is that the, the violence has predominantly come from the Tatmadaw. It has not come from the civil disobedience movement. You cannot put these two sides on a par. They are not on equivalence. And, and, and if there's going to be an appeal uh, for cessation of violence, it can only be directed to the Tatmadaw. And then 
we're going to start discussing about how to move forward on human rights and democracy. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Philip Formente, you know, um, in the early part, the Director General, I think even from the speech by uh, Ibu Retno, but he also mentioned that early on that us, that uh, with a part of member of ASEAN, uh, Myanmar has to be included uh, uh, because there are certain regional economic ties, there's global challenges. As he also mentioned about the cultural ties that's involved. So there's a lot of hamper uh, that would hamper the economic uh, regional uh, integrity. If not, the, the economy will paralyze. So I just want to ask you, um, back in February the 2nd, after the 1st of February, uh, uh, the coup, the United Nations uh, Security Council, or the 50 members, uh, had actually drafted a, a joint statement, although it was, actually, uh, it was announced by the president, but it was actually drafted, and I understand that the, uh, that the, uh, the British had actually drafted this, uh, this uh, so-called statement. However, there are countries, um, China was opposed to it, Russia was opposed to it, but what's, what's quite surprising for, for us laymen in this situation is India and Vietnam, where Vietnam is a member of ASEAN. So what is the background and, and uh, what, what sort of made them to actually denounce this? Was this more of a wait and see, or do they really have a firm belief and firm uh, policy uh, regarding anything that's related to uh, Myanmar or, or the military junta? Um, yeah, I think uh, that is a very uh, difficult question to ask because um, I can only guess why uh, India and Vietnam uh, displayed uh, that kind of uh, uh, behavior. Mm. Uh, in the UN, but uh, from uh, from my perspective, I think uh, for India, uh, if international community isolated Myanmar, and uh, by the way, they experienced this before. Uh, uh, Myanmar has been isolated for quite a long time, and they survived. And uh, the military, the Tatma Dao, I think uh, they think would be ready for another one, you know. So for that to happen, if that happened, uh, India would uh, probably be afraid that uh, then China might get in, and that would change, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, situation as well in terms of of, of geopolitics. And uh, uh, for Vietnam, I can only guess uh, that uh, Vietnam itself is not a uh, Philip, a, you were just going to say a democratic country. And sorry, uh, you know, uh, we got cut off. Can you just uh, go back right. to where you said? Yeah, Vietnam uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Vietnam is uh, somehow not a, a democratic country uh, themselves. And then the, uh, there is a precedent of this, uh, probably in Southeast Asia as well, of, of the coup, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, Vietnam uh, um, uh, probably uh, would think uh, the same thing as India, that uh, China might get in that would uh, make uh, Vietnam uh, in a very difficult position as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we're almost going to reach the final segment of the Q&A, but we do have a question from Grace Evelyn from the University of Mus Mustopo, Universitas Mustopo. Uh, this is uh, back to you, uh, Philip uh, Fermonte. How does ASEAN resolve the human rights abuse, particularly with Myanmar's refugees in neighboring countries, bilaterally or through ASEAN? I, I think this is also, uh, perhaps maybe uh, Marzuki Darusman can also comment on that. Uh, but Philips, go ahead. 
please. Yeah, on the refugee question, uh, I think uh, for Indonesia, uh, Indonesia is not, uh, to my knowledge, is not a party to the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugee or the 1967 protocol. So for Indonesia, usually we hand over the question of refugee in Indonesia if they reach our shore to <clears throat> UNHCR. But uh, in some cases, uh, the government might, might provide assistance as well. Uh, you know, uh, when Rohingyas uh, reach our shore in, uh, in Aceh, for example, I think uh, we did help uh, the, the, uh, the Rohingyas in, uh, in Aceh. And for other countries, <clears throat> I think uh, the, it depends on their status as well on the UNHCR, but uh, the neighboring countries, uh, like uh, what happened in 1988, for example, there were so many exiles and refugees coming from Myanmar to Thailand and they live, uh, the government of, of, of Thailand uh, let them leave uh, for quite a long time in, in Thailand and, and also in India and others. I think it, it, it depends on the specific cases for the countries uh, receiving or accepting these refugees and then some would go through the UNHCR, uh, UNHCR protocols. Yes, thank you. Uh, Marzuki, if you want to comment, uh, I'd just like to mention to the panelists and also the webinar participants, Pa Agus is ready uh, uh, to join us in this panelist. So, but before that, uh, can we ask Pa Marzuki maybe to comment on that? Thank you. Yes, uh, Pa Denny, I think this is a very uh, pointed uh, issue. Uh, uh, granted, of course, that we were not uh, signatory to the Refugee Convention, but it is the practice of the Indonesian government, and uh, rightly so and commendably, that uh, refugees come and go uh, through our country, so through Indonesia, on their way to elsewhere. And uh, we, we do provide uh, uh, facilities and, and, and assistance. Uh, for that uh, for that purpose, and do not uh, turn away these uh, refugees that have uh, either stranded, uh, were either stranded in, in, in our country or uh, uh, intentionally uh, passed through the, the country to to to, to uh, the, the final destina destination. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not going to mention uh, the, the particular country in our re in our uh, area or in in the region that. Uh, that has difficulties in accepting uh, uh, refugees. But of course, the pandemic uh, has caused a, a, an added, uh, added uh, a challenge. Yeah? Now, what, what could be uh, done, of course, as a matter of solidarity would be for the Indonesian government, uh, and, and this is a, a very bold step, uh, to announce that, that uh, if uh, there were to be any uh, outflow of uh, refugees uh, seeking asylum or seeking shelter outside, and uh, they were seen to be on their way to Indonesia, that maybe we could provide the facilities in Pulau Galang, in, in, in Galang Island, which to my recall uh, was in fact uh, uh, prepared uh, to accommodate uh, COVID uh, uh, victim, uh, COVID patients, and uh, there doesn't seem, seem to be uh, it doesn't seem to be very operational at the moment. And therefore, one asks uh, whether or not uh, the facilities are still there and uh, are underutilized and could easily be uh, made available for uh, refugees coming from uh, Myanmar as a matter of solidarity. Uh, it, it might not work out because there's some of them are in the jungles and they have to be able to travel uh, overland. But uh, the, the, the call and the gesture, I think, uh, would be uh, very sympathetic. Yes, thank you. Pa Marzuki, uh, I turn to Ex Excellency Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo. Uh, pa Agus, we have just, uh, are still in the Q&A session. And, uh, but before that, we had the panelists to provide some a short of a presentation and brief. Would you like to provide your 
perspective and also your views on the Myanmar crisis, regional and international solutions. Thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I'm late. Uh, I just returned from a, uh, another uh, webinar. Uh, I have uh, two news for the uh, audience of this webinar. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the bad news is that I don't have, I do not have any flashy slides to show you in my presentation. That is the uh, bad news. The good news is that uh, I will be as brief as possible, uh, so as to make the best use of time for uh, the discussion. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, tailor the information as required by the audience. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, is that some background of some background aspects of the Myanmar crisis. Uh, I don't think we will see an end uh, to this Myanmar crisis uh, once and for all uh, because of the difficult situation, uh, the difficult geopolitical situation of Myanmar. Uh, uh, and that uh, practically, basically, uh, they exist uh, as, uh, as a multicultural uh, nation uh, and uh, state, uh, and that uh, they have yet uh, to make a national consensus as to how they would like uh, to envision uh, uh, to, to live uh, as a multicultural nation. Also, they have yet uh, to determine with uh, Buddha as the large majority uh, as to how uh, they would agree on the arrangements between reli uh, religion and the state and uh, between Buddha and other uh, religions. Uh, it's a hard, hard issue, it's a difficult issue, but uh, they have to be uh, courageous enough to sit down and uh, bring all the uh, representative together uh, to come to uh, an agreement or consensus as to how they would like uh, uh, to live uh, and to see uh, Myanmar uh, as far as, let's say, uh, 30, 50, 100 years down uh, the path, down the road uh, as a, a multicultural nation. Uh, secondly, uh, also that uh, that uh, uh, influencing and current uh, leaders of that Madao or the military are not ready yet uh, to move on to lodge a reform uh, to transition Myanmar into a democracy. Uh, and uh, coming from uh, a military authoritarian uh, rule, uh, they have entered into that uh, classical dilemma of a new democracy. Uh, in their uh, civil military uh, relations. Uh, so that problems are arising after the election was a typical problem in civil military relations of a democratizing country uh, from a military uh, autocratic uh, state. Uh, uh, next uh, is that uh, trust has not been established between the military and the civilian political authorities. So whatever that external or outside parties would like to help, uh, if there is uh, no uh, teamwork, cooperation, or uh, consensus from the various uh, elements within Myanmar, then uh, I doubt that uh, that can be solved because this is not the problem or issues for outside countries. This is the issue for uh, uh, Myanmar. This is the issue for uh, the uh, Myanmar uh, nation. Uh, there is also uh, no conducive situation to establish trust building efforts between the military and the civilians. Uh, the civilian uh, political authorities uh, is uh, considered to be ineffective, uh, typical of a new democracy to respond to the national issues in Myanmar uh, and that uh, the military uh, as like in Indonesia coming out uh, as uh, the 
lead uh, element uh, in their struggle in the war of independence feels itself to be obliged and uh, responsible for the uh, safety and security uh, of uh, the nation. Uh, the civilian political uh, authorities have no or have little capacity in establishing civilian democratic control over the military. Uh, and that uh, the military uh, are, uh, mm, are worried uh, of the security situation uh, in the northern part of uh, Myanmar, uh, unable to be handled by the uh, civilian uh, politicians. Uh, although that uh, we cannot set aside that there are some, 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 some uh, self-interest from uh, within the military they, that they would, uh, they would uh, be reluctant uh, to surrender to their uh, civilian uh, counterparts. Then what can the international uh, community do? Uh, I will uh, focus on the uh, political and security side and uh, I will not touch on the uh, human, uh, uh, in, uh, human, uh, uh, human rights uh, aspect uh, that I will leave that uh, to uh, Pak Marzuki. Uh, in the past, uh, Myanmar has been looking to Indonesia as a model uh, with the similarity and uh, common uh, development uh, that went uh, down uh, in uh, the history of Myanmar uh, and Indonesia. Uh, until Indonesia uh, adopts the dual function of the military, uh, Indonesia was the model for uh, Myanmar. And when uh, Indonesia launched itself into the democratization process and reformed the military, uh, that, was, uh, that was the time that uh, uh, that it was not the model anymore for Myanmar, for those military leaders that are still interested uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, continue uh, with their uh, self-birthright uh, uh, principle of the only guardian of the nation, as the NI was in the past. Uh, so, uh, with Indonesia, uh, if I may say, uh, Myanmar has two problems. Uh, one is the position of Indonesia with the uh, Rohingya issue, uh, where uh, Islam uh, is the uh, majority uh, religion uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, and the other is a democratic process in Indonesia where the military has, uh, has, has uh, uh, terminated uh, the dual function uh, doctrine of uh, their uh, roles that uh, went uh, over the traditional uh, military roles. Uh, Myanmar is getting less interested with Indonesia as a model for uh, solution. Uh, and the question for Indonesia is, does Indonesia have to go it alone? Uh, if a better, uh, if a better uh, situation lies in other member states of uh, ASEAN. What I mean is that uh, Myanmar now uh, is looking more towards the model of Thailand, uh, where they have the similarity of a military coup, and uh, uh, to be followed by a sequel of uh, an election uh, which elected uh, the leader of the coup uh, as the uh, elected uh, public uh, official. Uh, that model uh, has been uh, looked into uh, by uh, Myanmar. So it looks like that Myanmar is approaching Thailand for support and uh, assistance for solution. Uh, Thailand would be attractive uh, to approach Myanmar uh, and open a start of talks or discussion. Uh, although that uh, one drawback for Thailand is that Thailand has no experience in military reform or uh, democratic transition. Uh, for that, uh, Myanmar has to look uh, to uh, Indonesia as the model. Uh, Indonesia has the experience for military reform, although not uh, with the military institutions uh, uh, now in effect, but elements that were involved in the uh, democratization process of Indonesia during the 1998 and 2004 uh, uh, transition. Uh, so uh, in the end, I think Indonesia has 
uh, richness of uh, experience uh, in bringing neighboring countries in Southeast Asia uh, to sit down and uh, to seek solutions uh, like, uh, in, uh, like in the model of uh, Jakarta Cocktail Party uh, in the past in fighting uh, leaders and components, national components of uh, one nation or one country and to sit down and uh, try uh, to find a meeting of the minds uh, uh, to, uh, to come to agree upon uh, as uh, the future uh, of the nation uh, or, or the country. So I think with that, uh, I uh, conclude my presentation and uh, open uh, for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bagus. Uh, I just have one question before we end the Q&A, and I do have a question for you. On February 8th, um, General Ming uh, Ung Liang had mentioned that this emergency call is valid for one year, where he is going to hand over power to the winner. So it seems like he wants to redo this election again. How likely is that to happen? And you mentioned that uh, Indonesia and Thailand is, is a role model. There might be a Dwi Fung Si involvement, a sharing power. I think that was mentioned by uh, Dr. Philip uh, Monte uh, when he mentioned that is probably going to be option one, which is sharing power. But how likely are they really going to do this time around? Uh, yes, uh, power sharing would be... Uh, uh, would be most uh, likely and acceptable uh, from our point of view, but uh, we don't know from their respective uh, point of view of the uh, parties within uh, Myanmar. Uh, now, uh, if the Tatma Dao uh, has stated, leader of the Tatma Dao has stated that uh, they will hold power and uh, and and and. Uh, uh, organize uh, an election uh, within one year uh, that would uh, likely to follow the model of uh, Thailand or Egypt. Uh, hopefully that uh, the military leader will uh, change hats, uh, although it will remain uh, in the same person uh, and has the uh, influence uh, uh, from the uh, military. But I doubt that uh, uh, I doubt that that would be accepted by uh, the uh, NLD uh, because uh, they have uh, uh, they have uh, stayed firm that uh, what they won was the constitutional election uh, uh, in the last election, and that uh, that any uh, let's say uh, any. Uh, miscomputations uh, would have to be proved and uh, 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 the, 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 the classical way is to go through uh, the uh, judiciary. So I don't think that the civilians will give up uh, of their constitutional uh, victory uh, and to, uh, to, 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 to organize uh, a repeat uh, of, uh, of an election. Thank I think you. what they hope, what the military, ladies and gentlemen, what the webinar participants, Ichwa. Yes. Um, we just heard His Excellency Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo. He is the governor of National Resilience Institute of the Republic of Indonesia. And I was just going to end this, but there is one more question. So I'm waiting for the committee to hand me more. We have one more question. Okay. Yes, uh, webinar participants, we are just getting this. It must be an important question. <laughs> so let's see what this question is and who is it directed to. Thank you for your patience. Yes, we're still waiting for the team to come up and hand me the questions. They're giving me the wait approach or the, the waiting hand. So let's see what this is, uh, what we're coming up with. There's four or five people looking at those questions right now. So it must be very important. <laughs> Mm 
Okay, do we have it? Okay, so the questions are coming up and it's through. Oh, okay. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we, I would like to read a question from uh, one of the person I know quite well. And in fact, I know his brother as well. But this question is from Rene Pata, Pati Rajavani. He is at the Center for Chinese Studies. This is a question to uh, Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo. Being the special envoy to Myanmar designated by, uh, during the President uh, SBY, Susilo Bambang Yudono, in office to discuss with the Tatmadaw, if you, if you see that the TNI is a model, what will be the distinction between TNI and the Tatmadaw? Does the military education of the officers in the Tatmadaw with little experiences in going abroad embrace their command and staff experiences comparing to TNI officers as the huge obstacles to understand the reforms of the military affairs. Yes, I think this is quite, uh, so this is a question from Rene Pati Rajavani at the Center for Chinese Studies, Pa Agus Wijoyo. Sir Pati Rajawani, you are putting me on the spot. Mm. <laughs> he uh, has always, Pa. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, the difference between uh, Myanmar and Indonesia, well, uh, Myanmar has, for, uh, has been for a long time uh, not uh, invited uh, to uh, any Western professional military schools, so that uh, transfer of knowledge uh, has not been acquired uh, by these officers. But when I went to Myanmar, uh, I talked to one of the officers uh, who, uh, who were from the uh, older generation and he recalled, you know, with a smiling face that uh, in the past, uh, we used to uh, go to Fort Leavenworth and uh, we were assisted on our uh, security operations up the, up the north uh, by uh, American uh, helicopters. But uh, after that, uh, there was no interaction. Uh, between uh, Myanmar uh, with uh, other Western military uh, professional uh, education institution. Uh, so uh, nothing had uh, uh, no uh, outside influence or knowledge uh, was uh, brought in. Uh, and uh, the same situation goes for the civil society. In Indonesia, uh, we, uh, we were at the peak uh, of our international relations, whether militarily or by the civil society. And that the civil society was vibrant and democracy was not only started to be discussed in 1998 or 1999 when President Sukarto, Suharto resigned, but way from back from the 1980s, uh, in fact, uh, from the 1970s, when President Suharto uh, came to power, uh, it was actually, we saw the resumption of Indonesia as part of the international community. Uh, Indonesia uh, has reinstated uh, its membership uh, in the United Nations and uh, Indonesia has sent uh, many uh, of its uh, citizens uh, to, to study uh, overseas uh, or, or abroad. So maybe that is uh, uh, the difference uh, so that a strong pool of uh, a strong pool uh, of uh, uh, modernization uh, agents, uh, change agents, uh, democratization agents uh, existed within the uh, Indonesian society. Uh, this has not been the case uh, within uh, Myanmar. If that was your question. Yes, thank you, uh, Agus. We have uh, a message 
uh, from the same gentleman, Pa Rene Pati Rajawani, to he, he calls you Bang Kiki. So of course we are mentioning to Pa Marzuki Darusman. Uh, and he says, you mentioned regarding the China question in scope of geopolitics and geographical scope in your analyzing presentation. Being the previous special rapporteur of the UNSG, are you implying that China hands in mingling in internal politics of Myanmar? If yes, where does the Chinese uh, siding with? The civilian authority or the Tatmadaw? And whether it is more economic reasons or beyond that, Thank you. So I assume this is the last question and it's directed to you, uh, Marzuki Darusman. Thank you, Pa. Thank you, uh, moderator. And thank you, uh, Bung Rene. I will perhaps uh, <clears throat> just follow on Pa Agus's uh, response, but specifically with regard to this uh, uh, contrast between geopolitics and geography it, it, and, <laughs> and connection and connecting this with China. It, it, it's, it's been said that for some countries, uh, China is a geopolitical uh, problem. But for ASEAN, it's a geographical problem because it, it's there. Uh, and uh, it's so visible that uh, that you will just have to uh, take it as a fact of life. Now, with regard to the internet, the internal situation in in uh, Myanmar, it's it's very interesting that uh, uh, during the week after the after the the, uh, the uh, takeover, the Chinese ambassador in uh, Yangon in Myanmar. Uh, came out with a very interesting statement that that this is not the situation in Myanmar that we would like to see, and that therefore uh, China is taking a somewhat proactive stance on this, uh, somewhat contrasting to their uh, their stance uh, in the past on uh, on a variety of issues. And that uh, fast forward in the last uh, week, we've seen uh, Chinese factories in Myanmar being burned down by the by the population, by the workforce, and by the uh, demonstrators, and raising concern uh, by China that uh, the government should be able to protect Chinese uh, interest in uh, Myanmar. Now uh, the the, the, the situation, of course, is that China is, is very much a part of, of uh, Myanmar politics. Uh, to start with, I think we're all familiar with the, with the infrastructure uh, uh, project, which uh, goes through uh, certain parts of uh, Myanmar, uh, which has caused uh, of course, that led to the the uh, crisis in in, in Reichheim, uh, in 2017 regarding the the pipeline that was supposed to be built uh, across that region and opening up uh, to the Indian Ocean through a port that was going to be built by the Chinese and and therefore uh, creating a, a sense of uh, unease. Uh, in fact, with the uh, Tatmadaw. Uh, so uh, it is an issue uh, th that needs to be addressed uh, because uh, China, of course, is very much a part of the region here and, uh, and uh, legitimately so that uh, any uh, resolution of the situation in Myanmar uh, granted, of course, uh, I, I do agree with Pa Agus that this is an entirely national issue, but nevertheless, it uh, affects uh, the region as a whole, and therefore, uh, at some stage, India and China may perhaps uh, will have to be brought into the picture. But uh, I would I would go for an ASEAN-led 
uh, formula and, and then uh, go beyond the confines of uh, ASEAN. But clearly, uh, China is a full player in the, in the drama there in uh, Myanmar because it has borders with Myanmar and it has very close relations with certain ethnic armed organizations on the ground. And it has uh, leverage within, within the country uh, and uh, that leads, that it, they leads it to, to have a say in what, uh, whatever happens in, 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 the, in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, webinar participants, that ends our Q&A. Thank you so much, Pak Marzuki Darusman, uh, insights that you have given. And also, we would like to extend our highest appreciation also to Ex Excellency Lieutenant General Agus Wijoyo, and of course, um, Dr. Philips J. Formonte from the Executive Director, who is the Executive Director for the Cent Center for Strategic International Studies. And I also would like to thank again our sponsors who have made all this possible, Jababeka and, and Co, and also President Tifi, and uh, others here, of course, the Ernst and Young and the Foreign Policy Community Indonesia. For this, I would like to hand over to my colleague here, uh, Ambassador Chandra Salim, who will uh, also take over for our next program. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the questions that you have provided us. And again, a heartfelt thank you for all the panelists, interesting discussions, interesting insights, and hopefully that we can be able to each an amiable type of solution uh, for the crisis that is still ongoing as we speak right now. Ambassador Chandra Salim, floor is yours. Thank you, Pak Denny, uh, for moderating very well. And I, I see that there were so many interesting questions and uh, very hard ones, but uh, they were answered very nicely, very correctly. And I hope uh, this may give uh, knowledge to the audience. Uh, now that we come to a close, I would like to ask His Excellency Ambassador Ibrahim Yusuf to deliver his closing remarks. Ambassador, screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chandra. The word of thanks has been extended by our moderator as well as also Ambassador Chandra. So I think nothing left for me to extend uh, again. But uh, what I would like to state here in the closing statement that um, we are very delighted and very happy that the great interest has been shown by the participants, either in, in Indonesia as also outside the country towards our webinar, because the registered participant uh, number more than 500, it is the over capacity of our Zooming uh, facility, because the Zooms only could accommodate around uh, 300 uh, participants. So in this regard, I would like to thank very much for the great interest by, by the participants. The second point is, uh, I would like also, thanks for all the speakers at this webinars. We have been presented the views and also answered the question uh, in intellectually and also eloquently. Now, um, I would like to say that our rapporteurs duly noted all the proceedings of the webinars and then uh, try to uh, design uh, into the reports and then submit it to the authorities' concerns. Who knows, it could be uh, becoming the policy inputs for the authorities on, on how 
uh, to resolve this very delicate, uh, very uh, hard problems, the regional and international solutions. The webinars uh, we tailor in such way because this is very um, pertinent and hard question for Indonesia who play the roles already and then President jo Excellency President Jokowi also calls for the uh, summit of the ASEAN uh, a few days ago and then also for the stability and the cohesiveness of the Asian nations. But um, this um, crisis taking place, I mean, the Tamadao, the Myanmar's military uh, undertaken to the coup, launched the coup on the 1st February, and then the lingering question now uh, spreading uh, in terms of the stability in, 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 in Southeast Asia. So it, it taken place and how to resolve this? It is the question. First, from the question answer, then it depends also for the people of Myanmar because it is related to the political cultures in, in Myanmar itself because since 1962, when General Nawin took over the government, launched the coup d'etat like this, then, then ruled Myanmar from 1962 up to 1988. So uh, he ruled Myanmar like his own fiefdom. This is the second point. This is the culture, political culture that had been imbued and had been planted in Myanmar. The second point, it taken place during the geopolitical shift and the geopolitical regional uh, geopolitical contestation, competition between India and, and China. We, we observe the statement from the Prime Minister of China, Wang Yi, recently, and also the silent nature of India. India, uh, one of the democratic in, in Asia, democratic country in Asia, didn't give any, any, any words on what happened in, in, in Myanmar. And then international solution. Can uh, international community uh, take initiative to resolve this problem? Because a lot of discussion also on uh, responsibility for the protection. Like what happened in Rwanda and also what happened in Yugoslavia beforehand. So could be done by international community. This is the question that uh, should be, be answered. But then from the discussion, we observe there's some uh, answer already to this question. Then we developed this uh, and crafted this uh, uh, answer becoming the policy input. So in this connection, I would like to thank very much for the sponsor, this is Jabba Groups, and then uh, and, and Young as well as the foreign policy community of Indonesia. Thank you very much for your support and sponsorship. Thank you. Now that we come to close, before closing, I would like to again thank all the sponsors, all speakers, all participants, and uh, having uh, wait until the end, and particularly pa Ibrahim, uh, that was very well recapped by him in his closing statement. And uh, we believe that uh, hopefully this uh, webinar will enrich you with the knowledge on the Myanmar crisis and hopefully will trigger how to resolve the issues at hand. And um, I would also like to uh, thank Jababeka as our main sponsor, Ernst Ng Yang and FPCI for our supporting uh, sponsors, and also for the Secretariat of ICWA that has been working very hard for uh, organizing this webinar, and not to mention 
all the technical people who are handling the uh, technicians, the technicality, I, I would like to give them the applause. And this uh, webinar uh, will be downloaded to Iqwa Indonesian channel, YouTube channel, uh, s.id slash Iqwa Indonesia. And uh, please uh, mark your calendar that there will be a next webinar by Iqra uh, that will be held in the first or second week of April on the rejuvenation of Indonesia's tourism industry, as well as supporting Indonesia's creative economy sector. And this and the invitation will soon come to your screen. Again, thank you very much.